Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, depending upon where you are. My name is Alan Tidwell, and I'm the director of the Center for Australian, New Zealand, and Pacific Studies at the School of Foreign Service in Georgetown University, Washington, DC. It's uh, wonderful to see you today and uh, have an opportunity to uh, welcome you and to wish you a, uh, a happy new year and uh, uh, to look forward to this inaugural talk of the year 2021. Uh, we will be hosting today along with our co-host, our new co-hosts, um, the Center for Pacific Island Studies at the University of Hawaii and Manoa, the uh, Peter Tolley Coleman uh, Lecture in Pacific Public Policy. And uh, we're so pleased to be joined this year by Palau President Tommy Remengasau. And uh, it's a true honor to, uh, to welcome uh, you, Mr. President, uh, for today's address. Um, I, just for a moment, I'd like to also introduce, introduce um, our, uh, uh, our, our very good friend, Amata Radawagan. Uh, Amata is the uh, Congresswoman from American Samoa, and it's for her father that the Peter Tolley Coleman Lecture is named. And I just wanted to spend just a brief moment to talk a little bit about Peter Tolley Coleman because you may not know who he is, and he's a fascinating man. Uh, 101 years ago, he was born in December. He and I, I think, were fellow Sagittarians, so, you know, go Sagittarians. But uh, uh, the, uh, the governor uh, served uh, in five different decades as governor of American Samoa, first appointed by President Eisenhower, and then served as the first popularly elected governor of American Samoa, and then served two other terms, completing his final term in 1993. And what a fantastic um, uh, period of leadership in that post-war era and uh, some fantastic and, and fascinating changes across the Pacific. In trying to learn more about Peter Tolley Coleman, I was really struck by something that he said, and it keeps echoing in my mind. And that is that phrase, come let us build the future in partnership. And I think what a wonderful ethos, what a wonderful uh, thing to say, and what a wonderful belief to have in the world that the future is built in partnership. He's a graduate of Georgetown University with a degree in economics and uh, also graduated from Georgetown Law School and uh, was an advocate of good governance and uh, of wise leadership. I'd like to now turn to his daughter, Amata Radawagan, the Congresswoman for American Samoa. And I'd ask my friend Amata Radawagan to introduce today's speaker, President Tommy Remigasu. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tidwell. Ali and Talo Falaba. I'm so pleased to make these introductory comments today on behalf of Georgetown University's Center for Australian, New Zealand and Pacific Studies in partnership with the Center for Pacific Studies at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. I'm delighted because both uh, the distinguished speaker today, His Excellency, President Tommy Esan Remegasau, currently the ninth president of Palau along with the name of the lecture series, which is obviously very special to me. It's a great opportunity to have President Remegasau speak. The people of Palau chose him because they know him. He has been in public service and high leadership since the 1990s as Senator and Vice President and President. And you know, it's a, it's a feature of islands like ours that we are, just of the right size to be able to truly know our leaders. Palau has entrusted their nation's direction to President Remegasau repeatedly. Governor Coleman would have thought highly of that. I wanna share a couple of examples of uh, President Remegasau's character. He has been known to recommend his, against his own pay raises, telling the legislature that they were not affordable at that time. And that is a fine example of leadership. In another instance, flying on a lengthy Pacific flight, the president, I believe, uniformed in a cap t-shirt and jeans was sitting in coach when one of the flight attendants recognized him and offered to move him to first class. 
he graciously declined. You know, I take those long Pacific flights all the time, and I do believe I might accept the offer. He invites challenges in elections. He lets results, his work, and his policies speak for him. The Republic of Palau is one of those places everyone should visit in their lifetime if they possibly can. They have a wonderful gift of nature, along with a supportive, contributing population, an awareness and responsibility that could teach all of us. In the Republic of Palau, you will see a clean and cooperative community. They value the Palau pledge to protect against pollution. Our nations are close friends and partners in unique association that is built on trust and shared values. President Rumegasau brings a wealth of leadership experience to this forum, and I'm excited to hear what he has to say. And with that, Mr. President, thank you so much and welcome. Soy fua. Thank you, my good friend, uh, Amua Amata Radwekan, um, in Coleman Radwekan, for that uh, uh, humbling introduction. And uh, I thank you, Director Tidwell, uh, for the opportunity to address this uh, prestigious institution and the many distinguished guests who have tuned in today. It's uh, early Tuesday morning here in Palau, so let me say good morning from this part of the world. It's truly an honor for me to be here. The, uh, the Center for Australian, New Zealand and Pacific Studies certainly produces some of the most uh, valuable scholarships on our Pacific region shining light on communities that often receive less international attention than they deserve. Peter Tully Coleman was a towering figure in the development of the modern Pacific. He was uh, America's longest serving governor and led the people of American Samoa through five separate decades, I believe as its uh, 43rd 51st and 53rd governor. As one of the Pacific's most prominent leaders, uh, his example was seen across the region, even in Palau and the North Pacific. But of course, uh, he led the North Pacific in more than example. He served as a district administrator for the Marshall Islands, as district administrator for the Marianas Islands, as deputy high commissioner for the trust territory of the Pacific Islands, and as High Commissioner as well. It is truly my uh, privilege to deliver this lecture in his honor. And not only from uh, a sense of uh, professional respect, but from fond admiration as well. Peter Coleman was a leader from my youth and a man whose career mirrored that of my own father, Thomas Ramangasau Sr. Before his service as vice president and president of Palau, my father served as district administrator for Palau within the trust territory of the Pacific Islands. He was a peer and a friend of Peter Coleman. And together they were two of the strongest leaders who helped guide the North Pacific to its independence. They provided steady handed leadership during a period of incredible social, economic and political change which is not to say things have stopped changing now, especially in the social and economic spheres. In the years since the trust territory, Pacific nations have achieved a level of political stability not seen in many other regions. But we continue to experience dramatic social change and we continue to face significant economic vulnerability. And of course, this last year has brought more changes than most. This pandemic has had a devastating impact on Pacific nations. This impact, which has included massive revenue losses, the disruption of travel and supply lines, and an enormous loss of employment across sectors, represents an unprecedented development change. But by stripping away so much, COVID-19 has also revealed the true state of the Pacific, and it has revealed a lot of good things. It has revealed the strength of Pacific national governments, which are bearing up under incredible economic strain. 
It has revealed the resilience of Pacific communities, which have pressed stoically to, into a frightening new normal. It has revealed the region's solidarity and the strength of regional partnerships as island nations pool resources and expertise. Isolated by travel restrictions, Pacific people now depend on their own leaders more completely than they have in many years. And Pacific leaders have risen to the challenge. I could not be more proud than I have been to see the COVID-19 responses of the FSM, the Marshall Islands, and Fiji, or of Nauru, Kiribati, and the Solomon Islands. And I won't list every Pacific nation here, though I am proud of them all. But there is a reason every COVID-19 free country is in the Pacific. And it is not just that we are all islands. It is that we have committed, each on our own terms, to protect our people at any cost. I have often said, business profits come and go, but you only have one life to live. To fight, to sacrifice, and to toil for every human life, that has been our, effective, our uh, objective. That commitment can only come from close-knit national communities that care about each other. To have so many of those national communities in one region is an incredible blessing. Of course, uh, COVID-19 has revealed problems in the Pacific as well, but nothing too surprising. It has revealed a lack of diversification in Pacific economies. It has revealed an over-dependence on foreign labor, especially to fill specialized positions. It has revealed the vulnerability of small budget, budget, uh, small budget Pacific governments to debt stress and it has laid bare the arbitrary metrics behind development financing graduations. Truly, these problems are not surprising and Pacific leaders have been struggling against them all alone. If COVID-19 helps our development partners see these problems more clearly, that would be one good thing to come from this last year. To come out of this pandemic, the Pacific will need a lot of help. It will need debt forgiveness, technical assistance, and renewed investment. There's no question we have work to do, as do countries around the world. But all things considered, the state of the Pacific is strong. Our nations are safe, our people are healthy, our institutions are resilient, and our leaders are charting a sound course. For one of the world's youngest and least developed regions, that is not a bad report card. The Pacific is experiencing the benefits of decades of good governance, going back to the efforts of my father and Peter Coleman, even before independence. Steady leadership has resulted in rapid political and economic development. It has resulted in strong institutions, communities, and national identities. It has created a strong regional community. To understand the strength of today's Pacific, you must look to the hard work of these past decades. And to do so, there is no better case study than my own home country, the Republic of Palau. Palau is small and remote even by Pacific standards. But the fact that you have invited me here to give this lecture says something about the strength of Palau's reputation. Despite its size, Palau is well known and highly influential, both regionally and globally. Perhaps the best example of Palau's global influence is in the area of ocean and environmental protection. When the, the pandemic struck, Palau was preparing to host the 2020 Our Oceans Conference, following in the footsteps of much larger ocean leaders, including Indonesia, Norway, and of course, the United States, which founded the Our Ocean Conference series. Our efforts to deter illegal 
unlicensed and unregulated fishing make global headlines on a regular basis, as do our leading positions on environmentally harmful substances and behaviors. Palau was the first to declare a nationwide shark sanctuary in response to destructive practices like shark finning. Palau was the first to declare a nationwide ban on chemical sunscreens with negative impacts on fish and coral. Palau made one of the most of the world's most aggressive nationally determined contributions, first one to the Paris Climate Agreement, and is on track to generate 45% of its energy from renewable sources by 2025. Palau is home to the UNESCO World Heritage Rock Island Southern Lagoon and to the renowned Palau International Coral Reef Center and to some of the world's healthiest coral reef systems. My friends, our researchers are publishing critical research on coral resiliency in a time when reefs around the world are suffering mass bleaching events. Of course, Palau's landmark initiative on ocean protection is the Palau National Marine Sanctuary, which took full effect last year after a five-year implementation period. The Palau National Marine Sanctuary, or PNMS, is a no-take area, which covers more than 80% of Palau's exclusive economic zone. Again, this area is absolutely no-take, and while Palau may be small, its exclusive economic zone is anything but. The remaining 20% of Palau's EEG is classified as a domestic fishing zone where locally based fishing operations target pelagic fish using approved and more sustainable techniques. Of course, destructive fishing practices like bottom trollings are banned in every zone of Palau's EEG. It is safe to say that the PNMS has turned some heads around the world and for good reason. Ocean states are struggling in recent years as they attempt to address significant and worsening losses of aquatic resources. Fish stocks are falling, critical species are struggling and ocean states are coming to embrace more active management of fisheries and other marine areas. As with destructive fishing practices, harmful personal care chemicals and renewable energy commitments, Palau is currently leading the world. These are not small commitments and each one of them has been more difficult to follow through on than it was to make. It took years, years of grueling work to procure Palau's first solar energy independent power producer agreement. It took years of research to develop Palau's prohibitions on harmful sunscreens and personal care products. And it takes time, money, manpower, and vigilance to patrol a marine sanctuary roughly the size of, Texas, of France. Palau is doing each one of these hard tasks, and if you will indulge me to say so, Palau is doing each one of them quite well. For a country of tight budgets and meager resources, I have found that there are two keys to carrying through a world leading initiative. These two keys are grassroots organizing and partnership. Now, let me tell you what I mean about the grassroots. In politics, I have always been a, a grassroots candidate, and I like to think I have been a, a grassroots president as well. To me, this means never losing touch with regular people, working to put food on their tables and to take care of their relatives. It means politics at the household level, hamlet by hamlet. In Palau, that is the way we approach major initiatives and difficult questions. Environmental protection is a great example of a grassroots issue. 
over the last 30 years, and especially over the last 20, since I first began my service as president, Palau has approached environmental protection from the bottom up. Rather than imposing Western or international values and practices, we have looked inward for inspiration from our own history and culture. Ancient practices like the bull, which helped Palawan man manage their own resources for thousands of years, translate directly into modern conservation initiatives like the Protected Areas Network, which create employment opportunities for local citizens to police their own critical resources. By building initiatives on our own existing value systems, we make them accessible to ordinary people throughout the country. And by employing local residents for enforcement, we build ownership in the communities we are working to protect. The grassroots approach has triumphed in Palau. And as my time in office winds down, I have full confidence in the longevity of our environmental efforts. The work we have done for the environment will be upheld for generations to come, not by politicians, but by the people of Palau, and especially by the people of our rural communities who directly depend on the resources we are striving to protect. Now, I did say there were two keys to these types of initiatives, grassroots advocacy and partnership. And sticking to the example of Palau's world leading environmental initiatives, we can identify many incredible examples of partnership. It is the, the Palau National Marine Sanctuary, a conservation commitment by and for the people of Palau has drawn support from friends and allies all around the world. It has inspired legal, technical, and financial support from environmental NGOs, foundations, and philanthropists, and from government partners across the Pacific, including Australia, Taiwan, Japan, and the United States. Each of these national partners have stepped up in a big way to make the PNMS a real, reliably monitored and heavily enforced marine sanctuary. It is patrolled by modern vessels from Australia and Japan, crewed by local marine law enforcement trained in international best practices. These vessels are guided by regionally managed surveillance flights and by remote technologies, including satellite surveillance. And at the end of the day, these vessels are reinforced by those of the United States Navy, which is committed to Palau's defense under the Compact of Free Association. These enforcement partnerships demonstrate an important concept, which is that while the PNMS receives support from all around the world, its strongest partners will always be here in the Pacific. This is not surprising as Pacific nations have the strongest incentive to protect migratory Pacific fish stocks. It makes sense to manage the shared stocks together through organizations like the parties to the Nauru Agreement. And it makes sense to protect them together as well through initiatives like the PNMS. Leveraging shared interest has allowed Palau to implement its values at scale and to create meaningful change. Of course, partnerships of shared interest are not limited to the environmental sphere. And some of the most prominent shared interests are those related to security. Shared security interests in the Pacific are captured meaningfully by the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. Inspired by the United States, the Indo-Pacific strategy is not much more than a shared commitment by nations throughout the Pacific to support mutual peace and prosperity. A free and open Pacific region is one with safe lanes of transportation, cooperative 
trade practices and a regional commitment to regional security. The Indo-Pacific strategy has been easy for Palau to understand and to support because it mirrors our long-standing practice. For generations now, Palau has been in a committed security partnership with the United States. The mutual benefits of this partnership have been obvious to the people of Palau as they have been obvious to the two leaders of the United States. As I speak, there are American vaccines going into arms across Palau. That is a dramatic example of the impact of US partnership, but it is also representative. The US Palau partnership is indeed people to people, and in that way, it is built to last. As you may know, the compact of free association has been renewed already, and we are currently engaged in talks to re-extend its provisions for economic partnership. These provisions uh, connect Palau in the United States through services of the US Postal Service, the, Feder the Federal Aviation Administration, and the National Weather Service. They connect the people of Palau with the people of the United States by establishing core bonds of transportation, communication, and commerce. These mechanisms could not construct, contrast more strongly with the practices of elite capture and malign foreign interest, which have become increasingly prevalent in the Pacific. And the core bonds of partnership written in the compact have been supplemented by ongoing collaboration and critical development. Tomorrow, Palau will formally launch its connection to the eco submarine cable network. This project will critically strengthen Palau's modern telecommunications capacity and provide resiliency against the ever increasing risk of extreme weather patterns. But the structure of this partnership is as important as the substance. Through a newly launched tripartite infrastructure partnership, the United States has brought Australia and Japan to the table with the development financing efforts split three ways. This is a welcome expansion people-to-people -people infrastructure development, as this tripartite partnership ramps up, it will help strengthen the bonds of the peaceful and open Pacific. I think that is where our two key concepts, grassroots and partnership, really come together. Grassroots efforts can be amplified through partnership, and partnerships are most effective when they target the grassroots. That's the balance I have striped for, and it is one I hope will outlast me. As you know, Palau and the United States are currently in high level discussions on the best way to strengthen US military presence in Palau. In an increasingly tense regional environment. This is a priority for both sides. But the key, the key is balance. To increase US military presence in a way that serves the people of Palau and complements our own efforts at domestic security. We have achieved this balance so far with civic action teams, port calls, and in the past, a small Coast Guard station on Angar Island. These initiatives have been successful because they serve the interest of both sides and similar opportunities abound. Tomorrow's ceremony, launching Palau's connection to a new second submarine cable network is again a great example. An increased military presence will require secure and resilient communications, which serve the grassroots as well as their security partners. 
Now, that concept brings us back to the beginning, which we never really left. It brings us back to the work of Peter Coleman and of my father. The interconnected Pacific with strong inter-island partnerships and strong development partnerships as well is the legacy of our post-war generations. It is the legacy of regional cooperation and sustainable development that targets the priorities of Pacific people. That is a recipe for success and one we cannot afford to let go of as we move into a post-pandemic world. Thank you for sharing this with you. May God bless all of us and God bless us all. Thank you so much. Wonderful presentation. And, and it's kind of hard to do mass applause for you on, on Zoom, <laughs> President, but, but pause. <laughs> I just want to say to the audience, um, I'd ask you to use the Q&A function um, in the Zoom uh, window. Uh, the president has very kindly uh, offered some time to answer a few questions. So um, as you're perhaps uh, typing your questions into the Q&A window uh, in the Zoom uh, uh, panel, I might um, uh, proffer my own question in the interim, if that's all right. I'm curious, you, you, you've talked at, at, at wonderful uh, depth about this, uh, the, the complexity and the nature of politics in Palau, uh, the, the grassroots and partnership components. And I thought those are very interesting. But I'd also like to press you just a little bit though on the question of regionalism and Pacific regionalism. And I was wondering if, you know, having spent eight years leading Palau, two terms, um, you have some reflections on the advantages of Pacific regionalism and maybe some future, future developments. Could you just talk a little bit about the place uh, that Pacific regionalism has in, uh, in Palau's plans for the future? Thank you, Director Tidwell. First of all, there's a saying, no man is an island, and therefore no country is an island. And I think uh, the reality is that we are all small island nations in the Pacific compared to, our, to many countries, uh, developed countries around the world. So there, is, there has to be strength in numbers, not in individuality. And I think in that sense, uh, the Pacific as a region comprises of many important uh, countries, not only their strategic importance in terms of peace and security in the Pacific, but in terms of the ocean of the issues that affects the whole world, climate change, oceans. So what better way for regionalism to take a hold of these important international issues and agendas? And we can only do so effectively if we do come together. There's commonalities in solutions and there's commonalities in the problems. So, and there's less revenues and there's uh, not enough uh, resources. So it makes sense and wise to really come together. And that's why regionalism is really growing and taking stock out here in the Pacific. We really have no other choice. And as I mentioned, grassroots, really bodes well with the, the Pacific culture of extended family system. And partnership on one hand also requires that we band together and secure the partnerships necessary to address many of these changes. So everything is connected in a way. And I've noticed that sense of uh, regionalism growing with the nationalism movement. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we've got a question um, from Lori Foreman from Hawaii. Um, she asks, uh, to what extent does the work of your research institutions like the Palau International Coral Reef Center inform your policymaking and development policies? In what policy areas does Palau need additional research help? Okay. So very quickly, uh, I'm, we're, we're all very proud of the, the work that the Palau International Coral Reef Center has done, prominent of which was the work behind the establishment of the Palau National Marine Sanctuary, 
as I mentioned earlier. The research has mainly reinforced the fact that tradition, traditional bull or conservation measures really helps to sustain the, the, you know, the resources of the ocean that we depend so much on, especially in today's uh, reality where harvesting is, is really more than the production uh, speed. We need to ensure that there are marine protected areas or protected, protected area networks that will help to uh, complement the natural process of, of uh, sustaining the population of our fish stocks and marine resources. Perhaps this has been the greatest, uh, one of the greatest contribution of the coral reef centers, helping to in advise our policymakers what they need to do to protect, what they need to, to do to educate, what they need to do to procure the necessary technology and science proven uh, methods in order to really sustain uh, what the ocean provides for us and what the future holds for our future generations. There's a lot of uh, uh, legislations that have come about, including, I might add, the, um, uh, the commitment for our uh, visitors when they come to Palau to sign on in their passport, a commitment to, to protect the environment and leave the environment uh, as better than when they came uh, to Palau. And this commitment is uh, called the Palau Legacy. And, and it took uh, a, a lot of the signs and, and a lot of uh, the understanding that uh, we needed to have a partnership in this aspect. And I might say uh, Coral Reef Center uh, also was a partner as well as our many of our NGOs. In the coming years, uh, Director Tidwell, we're going to need a lot of uh, uh, scientific research further into the marine protected areas, not only on what's on the bottom of the ocean, but really how does these marine protected areas translate to better life and, and sustainable life on the coastline? How will it benefit the people who also depend on these uh, resources? How will they better understand that what we're doing may be in some cases to some other fishermen, a limitation on their earning um, capacity, but really to see it on a more sustainable and, and, and maintainable way of life for our people. And that to me continues to be the challenge. And if we continue to listen to science uh, and not so much on politics and and economic uh, uh, debate, we can certainly ensure that there is a future for our children. And let me just add this quickly, um, Director. One of the blessings of this pandemic uh, situation, the COVID-19, has really given Palau, and I'm sure the rest of the Pacific, needed time to reevaluate where we are all heading. Where are the needed policies to ensure that when a COVID or a major disaster takes hold of the islands, what are the, the assets that we have? What are the options that we have? What are the blessings that we have been getting throughout the years that we need to continue to protect? Our borders are closed, but no Palawan is dying of starvation. Why? Because they can still go fishing. There's abundant fish along our reef for them to do that. So it's not the power of money or the economy that drives Palau's livelihood these days. It's what you have for the people, for the fishermen, for the grassroots, for, for the families to be able to rely on, despite the fact that our borders are closed. And so I think that has been the blessing in this guys, really reassessing your situation and maybe concentrating on those things that you seem to put aside, but now glares out the importance of protecting your environment. So just, just building on that, uh, you've got a question here from uh, April Herlevy from the uh, Center for Naval Analysis. And she's asked a question about um, Western development organizations. And she wonders what can 
Western development organizations learn from Palau and other Pacific Island countries in order to improve their development practices? And it seems to me like your, your answer there went some way to answer that question, but mm -hmm. I wonder if it, would you make some recommendations or do you think you could make recommendations to Western development agencies that, uh, that might improve their practices? So it all boils down to the, to what are the, the, the partnership that these uh, um, problems can garner or can help strengthen in terms of uh, the resource owners, which are the Pacific Islands, and the partners uh, that are internationally out there who can truly make a difference. Um, one of the things that we had looked forward to in hosting the Our Ocean Conference was very, was, was really this matter of what is the partnership that the Western uh, partners can do to help small island countries like Palau uh, address these uh, international problems when it comes to the ocean, when it comes to climate change. Um, because these are not problems, uh, Director Tidwell, that are limited or confined to the islands. Eventually, we are noticing what the impact of climate change is happen is to the rest of the world. Um, so addressing the you know the solutions and the answers here is actually addressing the uh, the uh, the potential impacts that can come later to to the neighborhoods of the the big developed countries. Uh, that is the message that we we truly wish to emphasize as much as possible that when it comes to climate change, when it comes to the, uh, to the issues of oceans, these two are all connected to health, to poverty, to development, and what better way to work with the islands who are the, surrounded by, by all these uh, uh, environmental uh, challenges. Uh, not to mention the fact that we are already on the front line of the impacts of all these uh, uh, solutions, uh, uh, challenges. Thank you. Um, I've got a question from uh, Ambassador Steve McGann, formerly ambassador to uh, Fiji. And uh, Ambassador McGann has asked, um, uh, this is a bit of shift of gears. Uh, would you give us an idea of the discussions with the United States in establishing a larger military presence in Palau? Uh, partic he's particularly interested with regard to the timing. So he, I think he just wants to probe a little bit more deeply into the, 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 the nature and character of those discussions with the US uh, over expanded military presence. So I, I think I said the word, the key word, the uh, balance. Um, and uh, because it comes down to what is the reali realistic way that Palau can truly be a, a contributing a partner. Um, the, the reality is very clear. We have security issues here in the Pacific, um, not only to to guard uh, our marine protected areas against illegal fishing and over and uh, unreported uh, fishing practices, but also to security for free transportation, you know, and respecting the integrity of our, our borders. So, in this instance, uh, it makes sense to look for a win-win situation, um, where in this case, our the United States, our closest security partner, uh, we both have obligations uh, under the Compact of Free Association to when it comes to security issues. So we believe uh, the patrol, for instance, the, the Coast Guard the presence of the U United States Defense uh, Forces in the areas of Coast Guard can be a win-win situation for, to ensure regional security as well as to ensure uh, the protection of our uh, and the integrity of our waters. Um, our environmental uh, uh, programs like the Palau National Marine Sanctuary uh, could also be enhanced uh, in science as well as uh, uh, food sustainable management can actually be a real thing when, when we are working together on this. So 
I mentioned balance because it's not something that we we also say come to Palau and build as many bases or military or there's already bases in Guam, uh, there's base in Marshall Islands, uh, in Hawaii. And I think the reality is that the UN, United States does not duplicate bases and functions that are already, uh, but we do have something to offer as far as location and as far as uh, limited work that can certainly happen in in Palau for the sake of the region and for the sake of peace uh, throughout uh, the world. So that's that's the point I'm trying to, to make is uh, a win-win situation, a mutually beneficial uh, working arrangement and presence uh, because uh, we have a special partnership with the United States. And, and just if I could press a little bit on that, just in terms of timing, there is no particular timing in mind with this. This is just things will mature as they as they will, or uh, is there any sense of, of a deadline or? Well, the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy is something that we have been talking about uh, in, in, in recent years. And I think it's not just Palau, but uh, many of uh, the island nations in the Pacific certainly feel a need uh, to pursue the objectives of the Indo-Pacific strategy. As Pacific Island nations, we have endorsed this strategy. And I think, uh, to be honest, I've often uh, mentioned this to our friend in the United States that you've said you wanted a stronger presence in the Pacific, but let's begin to really look at what is uh, indeed uh, doable uh, and mutually beneficial, because uh, the time is certainly ripe for now to, to do that. Thank you. Um, I, again, to sort of shift gears, uh, I've got a question from uh, Emil Freiberg from the Government Accountability Office. And uh, Emil uh, is asking about um, the importance of tourism to Palau's economy, and is wondering what has been the impact uh, on in this COVID, COVID time on the tourist sector and, and what is the plan for recovery? Uh, is, are there discussions underway about the creation of a travel bubble, for instance? Uh, and uh, looking into the future, how might tourism be reignited? And what are some of the risks in restarting tourism? Thank you, that's an excellent uh, question and really the pressing, the pressing challenge for the incoming administration uh, as well on how we can restart uh, restart our economy. Um, I never thought I'd see the day when we have zero tourists coming to Palau in a month. Um, but that, has the rea that is the reality that we, we have seen. And for an economy like Palau that depends uh, uh, so much on tourism as its number one industry, uh, the best way to come out of this really is to ensure the health of our people put the confidence of uh, our people uh, in whatever we're going to do. And that has been enhanced, uh, confidence has been enhanced, enhanced by our partnership with the United States. Uh, as we speak, uh, the, the vaccine, the coronavirus vaccine is being administered to our people. And our target of uh, uh, vaccinating 80% of uh, our people, certainly be by summertime, is uh, goes a long way to ensure that uh, Palau will indeed open up its uh, borders um, in a responsible manner. I might say that uh, to date, we are also very fortunate to be one of nine countries, I believe in the Pacific that has no COVID. Um, so that has actually been a blessing. Zero COVID means we have a, a local economy going despite the absence of tourism. The construction industry has been really active. Uh, uh, service industries, uh, bars, restaurants, hotels, you know, they've catered to the local, we call it domestic tourist. And that has been a good thing, you know. Even funerals, uh, which are a big thing in the Pacific because it been, requires a lot of gatherings and extended family. They continue to be uh, held uh, normally and funerals really are also, uh, an indication of a, a contribution to the economy because we buy a lot of stuff to feed people, uh, hundreds of people gathered. 
schools have been going on as normal. Uh, so business and businesses have stayed open. So in that sense, we've suffered, but actually we it could have been worse if our local economy was also devastated by having uh, uh, COVID cases in Palau. Um, what's going to happen tomorrow? We are again working on the, the, uh, the vaccine as fast as we can, but we recognize that Taiwan is uh, really uh, one of uh, very few countries that have really managed their uh, COVID situation. And we are in discussions right now to, to, um, to work with them for uh, uh, a, a bubble uh, economy or, or, or a COVID-free corridor situation that we can address. For example, uh, the new government coming in on the January 21, uh, the only foreign delegations coming are, uh, are the government officials from the uh, uh, Republic of China, Taiwan, uh, to, to, to share with us the inaugural festivities. Uh, so that should be the beginning of opening up uh, uh, partnerships. But uh, as with tourism, on a final note, uh, even if we do whatever we can here, it also depends on what's happening with uh, the rest of the world. We, we depend on the situation in Japan to improve. We depend on the situation with Korea to improve. We depend on the situation of the United States and Hawaii and Guam to improve so that indeed they can also relax their, um, uh, their uh, situation and for their people to feel uh, wanting to travel. So this is a two-way street that we continue to hope that the rest of the world will eventually come to a, uh, a better situation. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I, I have um, uh, uh, one more question for you, if I could, if, if you have time. Uh, this okay. is uh, from my uh, partner, Tarsisius Kabatalaka from the University of Hawaii. And uh, Tarsisius Tara asks, um, China is a growing influence in the region and Palau is uh, one of the four, uh, four Pacific Island countries that has a diplomatic relationship with Taiwan. Could you comment on the challenges and opportunities posed by China's growing influence in the Pacific? And uh, I think that's a sufficiently large question that you can pick <laughs> any part of that. Mm. Um, well, let me just say that uh, Palau is a friend to all and enemy to none. Um, if we had a choice, we'll actually recognize uh, China and Taiwan, but that's not our decision to make. Uh, the reality is that China is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, certainly a world stage player uh, in the United Nations and around the world. And uh, we respect that and we want to work with them on addressing uh, many, many common uh, challenges and solutions needed around the world. Uh, but we also recognize that uh, we have established a relationship with the Republic of China, Taiwan, and uh, we intend to, to pursue our common aspirations uh, when it comes to peace, uh, democracy, uh, principles and, and values. And, and those are important for, uh, for our friendships and for how we think of, uh, uh, of Taiwan. Uh, we believe we can coexist uh, just like we can exist with uh, 195 world countries that we have uh, established relationship with. And uh, the reality is that you cannot say you cannot work with any member of the international community because the a global family means everybody has a place on the table and something to contribute. Let me just quickly add, we would not be where we are if Taiwan had not also helped us with our COVID-19 uh, training and provision of uh, uh, equipment and supplies and medicines. So that's something that we appreciate. Taiwan, of course, has also contributed uh, much to the discussions on how we can keep the whole world uh, uh, safe as far as uh, medicine, technology, and, and advancement, and, and, and what's available out there. So I just believe that there is a role for everybody to, to play in. 
And of course, uh, when it comes to Taiwan-China relationship, that is certainly up to them to work out something uh, for them. But for Palau, we, we recognize that we need to work and respect and um, uh, as much as possible contribute uh, to what is on the table. Mr. President, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I, I, I know that we had you for an hour, so I just want mm -hmm. to wish you all the very best and thank you for your uh, excellent comments. And uh, I very much enjoyed uh, hearing your family's relationship with Governor Coleman. As you say, it's a full circle. And uh, it's, it's wonderful to share that with you. I wanna thank the audience for their time today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next presentation uh, from uh, uh, the Center for Australia, New Zealand and Pacific Studies. Mr. President, audience, I wish you good night, good afternoon or good day. Thank you.